Okay, thank you everyone for your patience. My name's Luke and I'm going to be speaking with Aviv to give a sort of broad overview of the state of bridging-based ranking and recommender systems, uh, split into roughly three parts. The first is evidence for uh, why bridging-based ranking would work uh, from a variety of sources, then the priorities for what we need to do to learn more about it, and finally Aviv is going to talk about the connections between bridging and deliberation. So uh, briefly, we sort of define bridging uh, according to this definition. It's a sort of a qualitative goal that you would want a, an algorithmic system that allocates attention to aim for. Uh, you can also think of it as trying to improve the quality of conflict in Jonathan's terms that he spoke about earlier. Uh, but there's different ways of implementing that in practice. One, uh, yeah, so three parts to this talk, starting with what we know. And I'm going to focus on one particular way of implementing bridging, which is the idea of diverse approval, very similar to what Ravi uh, just spoke about. So uh, you could use the heuristic that if something, a piece of content in a recommender system is in some sense approved of or endorsed uh, or thought favorably towards by people who would normally disagree with each other or who come from diverse backgrounds, uh, that that is, is bridging. And there's a, a, a leap there in your assumption as to whether promoting that kind of content will lead to positive conflict outcomes, but there's evidence for believing that it does, which I will step through now. Uh, there's a, this is a very crude example of what that might look like in practice, um, contrasted with a sort of caricature of traditional engagement-based ranking. So if uh, a post is you know, liked, say, by uh, people from different sides of politics, different factions, uh, then that would be ranked most highly according to this diverse approval heuristic for implementing bridging-based ranking. So there's sort of 10 sources of evidence, I think, that uh, we have for why this might be a good thing to do. The first, and I'll spend a little bit of time on this slide because I think it's an important intuition, but uh, the idea of sorting is that an important aspect of uh, the, ex the extent of conflict is not how extreme viewpoints are or how sort of divided people are along a one-dimensional spectrum, but how uh, dependent their beliefs are and their affiliations and identities are across multiple axes. So you can imagine if there's, there's two identities here, A and B, uh, in the most sorted world, those identities define two uh, perfectly separated groups uh, who, and there's no sort of cross-cutting uh, identities between them. Uh, but then you can imagine uh, if there's people who are in both group A and group B, or both, and in neither group, that leads to these identities to be uh, cross-cutting more and there's more sort of social cohesion. Um, and one argument for diverse approval is that it uh, surfaces ideas and content and affiliations that are in these cross-cutting uh, identities relative to the, the status quo. Uh, and there's evidence for this idea of sorting and cross-cutting as being an important conflict metric. Uh, there's studies that show, for example, that countries where uh, uh, that religion and ethnicity cross-cut each other, they're much less likely to have an outbreak into the civil war. A second category of evidence is, comes from contact theory, which is a large field. But basically, it's a fairly robust result that if people come into contact with people from the other side in non-competitive contexts, then that tends to reduce prejudice and animosity uh, between them. The third is the idea of surprising validation, which is that if uh, someone says something that you would normally disagree with, but that you agree with that person already or have some element of commonality with them already, you're much more likely to take that idea seriously and think if somebody like that believes this thing, maybe I should take it seriously. Um, and so uh, diverse approval as, as a heuristic would uh, include instances of surprising validation uh, within it. The fourth uh, source of evidence is that the, uh, so media effects are the, the effects that happen to us when we are exposed to items of media, such as items in a recommender system. There's a bunch of uh, evidence to suggest that uh, you can have effects on conflict outcomes just by being exposed to pieces of media. So this uh, study on the right hand side, the Strengthening Democracy Challenge, tested a bunch of interventions in sort of social media contexts and found that you can just by showing people on a screen reduce things like partisan animosity. There's also a bunch of uh, well-known effects in psychology that uh, just by being exposed to certain types of ideas become, tend to become more aligned with those ideas. So in theory, it should be possible from that perspective. The fifth point is that you really do need the approval part of diverse approval. Diversity alone is not enough. There's a well-known study 
here by Chris Bale that if you just uh, pay people to follow bots on Twitter that post things from the other side of uh, politics indiscriminately, they tend to become more polarised effectively. And uh, so you really do need some bridging element of commonality. It's not just enough to indiscriminately show people stuff from outside their, their in-group. And then there's a bunch of more empirical uh, sources of evidence. So uh, there is beginning to be work testing bridging algorithms in practice. This is some pilot data from Jason Burton, uh, who has shown, at least in this pilot, that uh, ranking tweets uh, according to bridging um, tends to be slightly negatively correlated with engagement, but also negatively correlated with toxicity. Uh, and there's a, a lot more emerging work along these lines. Uh, then there's a few deployments. So this is not a well-known platform, but my ex-advisor uh, at the University of Melbourne built this platform in Australia using during the 2013 federal election. Uh, and it was sort of a policy debate platform at the ranked contributions. And one of the key algorithms it used to rank contributions was on the idea of uh, bridging. If you manage to appeal to people who usually disagree with you, that was a, a strong signal for the quality of the content. And the key takeaway from this, I think, is that the clever users of this platform figured out that that was what they needed to do to get attention and get visibility, which uh, suggests that the incentives of the system uh, were effective. There's Polis, which uh, Colin will be talking about later today, so I won't go into too much detail, but it's a, a key example of bridging in practice. Twitter, which you've heard also about today already, so I won't talk about that, but yeah, another, another positive example of this, working with very few uh, downsides. And finally, as Ravi alluded to, there's work at Facebook where they implemented this diverse approval idea and uh, not in the main feed, but in ranking comments and so on. And it led to, had all these sort of positive side effects, uh, which uh, you can read about in the Facebook papers. So uh, to conclude this section, I think most of the evidence for diverse approval is fairly indirect. There's a few deployments at platforms. But we really need studies that sort of comprehensively test different implementations of uh, diverse approval and bridging based ranking in general, uh, more to a greater extent quantify the trade offs with traditional engagement uh, based ranking uh, and have more direct causal links between uh, bridging based algorithms and conflict outcomes. So, second, I'm going to talk briefly about what we need to learn more about bridging. Uh, Aviv and I have this paper where we set out a bunch of the open questions and problems in, in bridging systems. But to summarize, I think there's three main areas. One is we need methods for uh, implementing them at scale that work uh, and that are increasingly sort of uh, attuned to the different divides that might want to be bridged, uh, which are more or less important for uh, the outcomes that we want to affect. The second is that we need more implementations of, the, of bridging systems across different contexts. Uh, both to sort of experimentally test uh, how these work in practice, but also as examples to point to to say it works in this context, it works in this context, um, and the, the downsides have been relatively minor in comparison to the benefits uh, to the extent that that is the case. Uh, and to that end, I'm working on putting together a series of case studies of existing bridging systems. It's not quite live yet, uh, but if you're interested in that, please let me know. Uh, and also there's a bunch of people in this room who are thinking about experiments or have experience running experiments uh, so there's uh, yeah, lots of discussion to be had around that. And finally, we need metrics for evaluating uh, bridging systems and conflict outcomes. There's different uh, goals that we might have in mind when we're doing bridging. There might be epistemic goals around increasing the accuracy or factualness of information. There's reducing conflict risks like political violence or ability to coordinate. Um, but we need metrics for measuring these things and evaluating the extent to which we're actually impacting them. I have a big sort of survey of formal me measures of division in models of a population, uh, which is a work in progress, but you're welcome to check that out. And also a uh, preprint I'm working on uh, at, around measuring and quantifying this concept of sortedness in a way that is comparable across different contexts. Uh, so that's that, and I will pass to Aviv to talk about the connection to deliberation. Okay, thank you. Oh, we needed to do the, the oh, you did, you did it already. Great. Excellent. Um, one second. Put this back in my volume. Okay. 
hear me clearly? Excellent. Um, thanks, Luke. Um, hi, I'm Levi Vavadia. I'm going to talk a bit about the relationship between bridging and deliberation and some of the uh, early stage um, projects uh, sort of relating uh, these two. So why do we care, first of all, about bridging and deliberation? Well, you can think about them as sort of two connected work streams. For me in deliberation, a key motivating factor is around how we can effectively make decisions, including democratically, across national boundaries, and what that even looks like, and, and what that might even look like at global scale. And, and we, we need bridging and deliberation to do that well. Um, and an underlying goal is that I think we're, we are going to need better, faster, deeper governance across difference to get to a positive future in a world with global connectivity and accelerating AI advances. So we're going to need it soon. So bridging and deliberation, they very much build off of each other. We use bridging in deliberation, and we use deliberation in bridging. Uh, we can use deliberative processes to govern bridging. And these processes both inform each other. And we, we have a huge amount of learn, to learn about or from effective deliberation processes. This photo is from a deliberation process convened by the EU, EU government to help shape its future. And the, the people there are not um, uh, parliamentarians. They're, they're citizens from all walks of life, chosen through democratic lottery at random um, uh, across every official language in every, every country of the EU. We can't do this sort of thing without implicit bridging. Another place that bridging fits into governance is, well, a key question around bridging is how much bridging should we actually have in, like, who, who, like, where should it be used? Who should decide? Like, and that question of who decides matters, especially within the context of these transnational platforms and infrastructure. They operate across boundaries, um, uh, both things like Facebook and things like OpenAI. Um, we can think about this sort of bridging force that these systems provide across society due to their ubiquity, a sort of digital air that we're breathing that will either push us apart or bring us together. And democratic deliberative processes provide a non-paternalistic mechanism for collectively determining the extent of bridging that we want to subsidize across societies and across borders. And then finally, well, bridging is a critical component of deliberative processes, obviously, from polis to facilitation of citizen assemblies to the development of facilitation tools. We want to be thinking about bridging. And so we talked a little bit about prior work from us and um, many others here. But what's next? Many different paths. But I'm going to just talk about one particular piece that I think is, is or two pieces that I think are interesting. Um, and that's around mapping the holes that we need to fill with resources and funding to get the deliberative and bridging infrastructure into place, including potentially at global scale. So how do we best understand what processes to use where? Well, one of the basic things that we need and that we'll, we'll benefit from is having a better idea of how they all fit together across those scales. And for that, I think we, we need to develop a visual language um, for deliberative processes, both that are manually facilitated and tool-based, and, and really understand how they fit together. Um, we can sort of map their type signature, the inputs and outputs, um, the key properties, the state changes. And, and this builds on some of the, some of the prior work um, uh, around collective response systems that I presented at the last plurality event, which sort of mapped and characterized a very specific kind of deliberative process, things like um, a uh, polis or remesh. It, it's not quite a type signature, but it's the same sort of general direction. Um, and as we alluded to in the plurality event, given this sort of framework, we can explore where and how to bridge different subcomponents or to bring bridging into subcomponents and then measure the bridging at each output. Um, but collective response systems, they're not general enough. They're, they're other kinds of deliberative processes. Um, they're just subparts within larger processes. Um, but, but we can create these type signatures at multiple levels of abstraction to, to capture this in a way that, that's useful for, for understanding these systems. And this also helps understand how best to chain and combine processes. We want to know which processes are applicable where, including within existing processes, so things like the policymaking process or conflict processes. Um, we want to have a level of rigor around the conditions needed to advance to the next stage of the process that could be useful in deliberative processes that are tied to power. Like, what is good enough? And, and one important open question here is, what kinds of existing process should we be thinking about that these modules are fitting within? Right? The, you know, we have um, 
uh, decision making and policy making and conflict. That's, that's, those are areas, and even within those, there's so many sub areas and so many different existing ways of thinking about things. And ultimately, I want to be able to sort of, this is a you know, very crappy first pass, just to sort of put this on the map as a set of ideas. Um, but I want to map complex processes and characterize their structures, their risks, their benefits. Um, and if you have frameworks, processes, or examples that you want to share, or if you're interested in, in doing this sort of mapping or being involved in developing this sort of visual language, let me know. Um, and we also put together a short, small, short workshop that feeds into these sorts of approaches. I was going to do that here, but decided to sort of push that off while it was together just because of other things that are going down. Um, a big part of which is in the past, uh, I guess, you know, a huge part of the work in the past few years has been around getting deliberative processes on the map, right? Um, and bridging processes on the map. And I think they are, you know, because of all the reasons that we talked about. And the good news here is that we actually sort of have one, right? Every day there's more talk and action. We get new, new kinds of processes um, to understand and get ahead of, of, of both platform issues and AI uh, challenges. And every major actor in the AI world and some major regulators are all now talking about this as of the last few days. Um, so OpenAI, DeepMind, and Anthropic, they've all publicly expressed their interest in uh, and deliberative processes, helping with some of that. Um, but there are huge amounts of divisions when you're thinking about the, the, the issues here that, that do need to be bridged, including deep ideological and geopolitical rifts. So what are the processes that we should be investing in that are best for these applications? And what are the kinds of deliberative infrastructure that we need? There's a whole slew of new institutions that I think we are going to need um, in, this new, in this future that we're sort of heading toward. And some of them are going to benefit. Um, some of them are just going to benefit from deliberative, deliberative processes. And some of them are absolutely need that in order to get to a good future. And so I think that for me, this like the goal of this sort of work and the work that we're all doing here is around being like ensuring that we are ready to fulfill that need um, and can and can allocate those resources as needed to to get to that that good outcome. And I will I guess Q and A for both of us. Thank you. Yeah, that is there's a lot there. So just the question was around the role of language. Um, in deliberative processes, especially, I guess, when tied to power, is that? Yeah. Like power dynamics. yeah. So I don't think, um, I don't think we're going to, I think this is a great offline conversation because there's a lot of depth here. Um, and I think we all have varying levels of expertise um, around this. But I think one of the key things I'll say is that I, I think that this question is an example of a kind of, um, in, a sense in this framework, like input and output. It's like, here are, when you're talking about language, let's say contention, like language that can be really be seen in, dip, actually, taking a step back, there's two kinds of questions about language. One of them is around like French versus you know, uh, uh, Spanish, and the other one is around like using this word versus that word in a particular context. Which one are you, are you asking about? I'll or both? Later. Okay, I'm so. Right, okay, so signaling power through language. Yeah, so I think that there are, there are gonna be places where, you know, in, some, in this sort of deliberative module sort of framework, where like, one of the goals of a kind of module that we see implicitly in the actual work, like there is a module where the, the agenda setters are actually choosing the language, choosing the ways in which they're, um, they're communicating in setting up a process. Like that is its own sort of micro process that needs to be part of any of these kinds of frameworks. And I think like, being explicit about this, part of the reason to create a visual language about this and, and to create a, a sort of shared language around this is to be able to say, talk explicitly about that because I think it is actually incredibly important. It depends what you mean by worked. I think, um, oh, sorry, the question was, uh, is there a, examples of uh, what a good metric for bridging is in particular use cases that, where you can show that bridging has actually worked? I think um, if you're interested in improving sort of conflict outcomes, there's not that many deployments of bridging that have actually measured uh, that directly, uh, which I think is uh, a key area for future research. I think the sort of sort in the space based metricization of conflict outcomes is something that's quite tractable in sort of online platform settings and would be probably near the top of my list of things to look at, but also survey based measures like do, do people feel heard, do how much uh, political animosity do they have towards people on the other side. Uh, I, I think those yeah, surveys and sort of sortedness are probably the, the top for conflict outcomes. Um, 
yeah, if, if your goal is improved quality of information, there's other, there are in, in community notes and other deployments much more uh, well established measures of quality and that kind of thing, which um, are in use already. Uh, yeah, that, that would be what I would point to. And, and just to sort of add one more piece here, I think part of the reason to really think about what is a sort of shared language for talking about sort of the modules of these processes is exactly to characterize, given a set of inputs, what are the, um, like, what are the kinds of things that we can measure? Um, what are, like, in this case, we're talking about state change. We're talking about, like, are people changing their relationships, maybe even as a result of these systems um, or these processes? Like, being able to characterize that clearly and being able to say, this kind of bridging metric is appropriate with these kinds of outputs, that is, like, the like a core reason why I think it's important to, to have this sort of shared shared um, uh, way of communicating around these processes, and it's motivating by questions from you and others. Yeah, um, so the question is, a you know you could think about a market as a kind of deliberative process in some sense, um, and what is the uh, extent to which we should be sort of leaning into into having many places that you're sort of choosing among versus um, sort of deciding what, to, what the sort of policies of a particular system should be. Um, and I think that uh, markets work in many contexts. Um, they, when, the, um, when the thing that you're trying to address is something that doesn't maybe have clean boundaries, um, where there's lots of side effects on other people, uh, the um, uh, where the the act maybe the very expensive the really difficult parts of it for example something like Facebook or even the outputs of, of language models like um, when those things are like there's an incredible amount of investment that you need to do in order to make those things things that are actually beneficial for society um, you may have uh, there may be economies of scale um, and there may be really significant benefits of governing those things in a democratic fashion deliberative fashion. But then, um, but but basically, leaning on, on voice over exit in the Aldous Huxley sense. If anyone, if you are all familiar with that, this idea of how do we actually govern this because this is a shared resource. You, there is an implicit shared resource here, um, even if they're you know marketed among different systems. And so, I think the liberation does play a significant role in environments where there is there are implicit shared resources that are that have all of these externalities, um, and where you cannot sort of oh, I'm going to go to this other system because the market allows me to do that. Well, it's, that's still having a lot of impacts on, on people who are still in the original system. I think we need to wrap it up, but thanks everyone for your attention. <laughs>